the number one Costa Rica real estate and investment podcast, bringing you experts from all over Costa Rica. Good afternoon, guys, and welcome to episode 204 of Costa Rica Real Estate and Investments with me, your host, Richard Beckson. Today, we're going to be talking with Anthony Lewis, owner of Radpad. It's a company that builds affordable vacation rentals. They've been doing it in Nicaragua. Uh, they also had just uh, a project here in Platanillo, which is in the southern zone. Uh, and we're going to be talking to Anthony about what Radpad, it, Radpad is. That's R-A-D-P-A-D, Radpad. Um, and how it can benefit anyone looking to have a vacation rental on their property. Well, guys, uh, as I said, we're here into the, I suppose, the third season really here uh, of the uh, of the podcast. I hope everyone's enjoying it. Remember, if you're looking to do anything in, here in Costa Rica um, and just looking for a little bit of the logic behind the uh, emotion of investing in Costa Rica, as I always like to say, we're your pain in the butt. Um, so that you don't have to be and you can kind of enjoy it uh, and just kind of really give you perspective when making you know the right investment for you based on your goals so that you don't kind of lose your mind, which is very easily to do after a few cocktails or the beautiful tropical air that we have here in Costa Rica. You can email us info at investingcostarica.com. That's info at investingcostarica.com. Or in the description down below will be links where you can organize a meeting with us and we're more than happy to help you out. But anyway, let's get straight into the podcast. Good afternoon, Tony. How are you doing? I'm doing excellent. Thanks for having me. And not at all, man. It's an absolute pleasure. As I say, I'll uh, talk to anyone about anything Costa Rica related. And I think what you're trying to do is I think, you know, with Radpad, I think that there's a lot of demand for it. So, uh, so yeah, it's great to get you on here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I've learned so much from all your podcasts, man. I've been binging them. And now I'm on to your um, reel. No, not reels. The, uh, the shorts on YouTube. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think that they yeah. just, the, the guys in the office just take stuff from the actual podcasts, but um, yeah, I think we've thrown up some webinars recently as well, um, yeah. which are a little longer, um, but we have a yeah. webinar coming up um, on, with an architect where we're going to chat with an architect on it and kind of go through that process. So, so yeah. Nice. Well, if there's anybody out there like me with the uh, short attention span, man, those, uh, those shorts are awesome. They're just like dropping bombs one after yeah. another. Don't, don't do this. Don't do that. <laughs> Yeah, well, I suppose yeah. at some point we should start saying do this and do that, right? But uh, uh, ah, yeah, 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 there's a lot of that too. There's true, a lot true, of that. Too. Well, yeah. I mean, as you said, I mean, we were just chatting. You know, you've been here in Costa Rica now for quite some time. Um, I mean, what are you seeing happening here in Costa Rica? I mean, are you still seeing the market pretty, uh, pretty buoyant? I mean, what what is your perspective? Okay, well, my perspective, right? So I got to uh, Nicaragua right before COVID. And I stayed there through the whole thing. So I never left for about four, four years, four and a half years. Yep. And I, I just crossed the border the first time, um, maybe 160 days ago, about a half a year ago. I just came over on a trip just to explore Costa Rica. And when I saw it, I was like, it was overwhelming. It was like, wow. Um, so I, I had friends um, that lived in each one of the beach towns. So I took 10 days and I started in nasaro and did guanacaste all the way down through jack Haco, um and then wound up in dominical where i am now Ooh. and um it was mind-blowing man i mean there's 1000 prospects for every one prospect in nicaragua yeah you know it was just like whoa yeah I, I was i was about to ask you you know i mean you've done some stuff in nicaragua i know nicaragua very well um you know we've done yeah. some, some stuff up there but i mean how do the two countries differ i'm sure it's night and day but I mean, i'd love to get your perspective yeah my perspective i mean i like to go deep into things um about a year ago i stopped fixing problems and i started looking at problems as like little indicators to find the cause you know and then find a solution for it so when I go into like the difference between Nicaragua and here, I mean, there's obvious ones. There's no like horse parts on the road here. There's Mercedes and BMWs here and you won't see that there and that sort of thing. But I'd say uh, a cultural difference and it's like a psychological cultural difference, like in a business. Um, and I'd say people in Nicaragua, the culture is almost of scarcity. It's, it's, um, I'd say the majority of people that I've encountered there have a certain amount of, of resource and they, they uh, hold on to it tightly and it, as it slowly dwindles. So they've kind of left the United States or left Canada or Europe or whatever, and they've come with one big nest egg 
and they're basically each day is kind of kind of a little bit worse than the last day. Yeah. Um, so it's a it's a culture of scarcity. Uh, whereas what I've seen here in uh, Costa Rica, the majority of the people I've met are still um, generating income from uh, the U.S. and Canada and, and Europe and where and whatnot, and they have this like this abundancy the opposite it's kind of like there will always be more uh feeling that you get here so i yeah i really enjoy being around um uh you know dream a lot of dreamers that make it happen like crazy builds i've seen here it's just like wow great good for you (laughs) yeah i mean that's the biggest difference i i think that costa rica politically and from a security standpoint you know just politically, it's not a dictatorship, a democratic dictatorship, if that makes sense. Like it is a de- it is a democracy. So I think from an investment point of view, it's just a safer investment. Hence why we've had that foreign investment come in. Absolutely. I think um, to really understand Nicaragua, I think you'd have to go and, yep. and you'd really have to live outside of the gates of the community of this, you know, really live in Nicaragua, Nicaragua and spend, you know, a year or two there to really understand it you i couldn't tell you there's no way i could explain to you um that nicaragua would be a safe investment you'd have to go and really understand it yourself well i mean from an investment point of view like how would you compare the two i mean would you consider making an investment in nicaragua you know you know or like if someone's thinking about the two but probably wouldn't be on the same spectrum like how do they measure when it comes to investment yeah, it's it's tough. So first, you got to, you know, a lot of people here are super, super scared of going to Nicaragua. And I'm like, what do you mean? I, I mean, I've been there four years. Mean, I, I'm not scared yeah. to go. Yeah, I'm scared less. I'll go anywhere in Nicaragua anytime and I'll have a great time. Um, but I, I don't do drugs or drink alcohol or party or look for trouble. So I'm always I found anywhere I go, I'm good. Cause I'm not, you know, rolling with the wrong people. Yep. Um, so. So then people in Nicaragua are scared to come down here. They think it's all gangs and narco and all this stuff. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I personally haven't seen any of that since I've been here. Yep. But I do go to sleep around nine o'clock. So, <laughs> well, I mean, look, I think that there's if you're looking for it, as you said there, it's here, it's there everywhere. But I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Oh, uh, back to your question, investment. So I'm doing something yeah. up in uh, Popoyo area. I really love that area of Nicaragua right now. There's a new coastal road going in and all sorts of, you know, if it gets finished, that's the thing, you know, um, it started a lot. Nicaragua started a lot of really cool projects. Um, and a lot of them or maybe one or two haven't come to fruition. So this one looks like it's really happening. This new road that connects a new border from Costa Rica all the way up to Managua and it opens up 58 new beaches. So it's like, and it, you've been to beaches in Nicaragua. They're like, they're mine. They're so beautiful. Yep. Um, so, so I'm, I'm working on a project up there where the lots done lots are done with the title done properly. And I have a, I have a really extensive, uh, system or checklist for that. You know, uh, we've got lots for, uh, $5,000. Yeah. So, wow. you know, yeah, and I mean, that's like five that minutes walking you, to the beach. That doesn't get you anything hit. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't even get you a lawyer to look at your, you know, plot document or whatever so um they're 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 totally different um but the thing is is that here you know people people tell me that nicaragua is so much cheaper than here and i say well what is cheaper if you can't generate income you know so yeah we can go build a surf camp but like how many surfers are really going to come you know where here i can do a surf camp here and i got there's a serious market for it you know like uh there's there seems to be more people than accommodations here where where i am in in costa rica during this peak season these four months yep um then then there are rooms available and then in nicaragua there's often more rooms available than there are people for them yeah it's the opposite yeah well i mean look nicaragua had a great run and like you know all the way up to i mean wow what was it like five six years ago i mean it was doing amazing 2018 yeah yeah Yeah, it was up right up to 2018 it was insane I mean, the yeah. owner of Hikaru Lodge and the, the, guy, the guys that run that, you know, they we're just doing really, really well. Um, yeah. But unfortunately, you know, yeah, then the political unrest and, you know, I mean, yeah, it's kind of like, 
you know, and even here, the Costa Rican government the other day, SUHEF, which is the kind of like RSEC, sent out an email saying, look, we want to know everyone that's working with Nicaraguan companies, um, you know, because it's, you know, I mean, I always like to say this is like another state of the U.S., uh, so the yeah. U.S. is anti-Nicaragua, so now Costa Rica has to be kind of somewhat anti-Nicaragua, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I just yeah. did my border run up there the other day, uh, and it was it was a blast. I, I only meant to go one, you know, like one hour over there and come back, or like 10 minutes, whatever. Uh, but I wound up being there three days. It's and beautiful. It was, it was like, yeah, it was such a, it's just so, I don't know if it's humbling is the right word, or it really makes you put your patience pants on and your tolerance and your all the big stuff that, that's good to bring back here, you know? Yeah, well, Nicaragua's um, raw. Like people... You know, like Costa Rica is difficult sometimes with certain things. I'm sure it's even worse in Nicaragua, you know, but like people up sometimes get frustrated in Costa Rica and it's like, well, like there are other countries, like even in Panama sometimes that it's even worse. You know? Yeah. No, they wouldn't. The, the guys like the people, no, you wouldn't make it. I mean, like to build in Nicaragua, I'm, I don't know what building experience you've done up there, but like I built I built a few things and and it is not like you know i came out of canada just finishing building wineries and recording studios and high-end stuff and i'm there and i'm like all right we'll order all the machines and they're like uh the machines are these manchachos i'm like what <laughs> you know like everything was different you know we were using uh, shovels uh, and machetes and just hard. resourcefulness yeah they oh, dude, hard. like that much respect much yeah. respect you yeah know, i mean yeah. all the construction guys mainly here in costa rica are from nicaragua Totally, man. The, even the guys I just met now um, were, you know, they were working so hard. I was like, dude, you guys are like, this is the real deal. And then then they were like, oh, we're from Tunadega. I was like, ah, oh, of course you are. <laughs> well, tell us yeah. a little bit about Radpad, kind of how it came, how it came about and like how you guys add value. Yeah, for sure. So Radpad, I mean, if you want the whole enchilada, the whole story, Radpad is an idea that came from necessity, right? So I had a, um, hmm, oh man, how to get into this without getting too into it for you. <laughs> um, I had a restart in life yep. and that was uh, two and a half years ago. So two and a half years ago, um, my wife left back to the United States um, and then my children went with her. So I have three lovely daughters and they went with her and there was a, um there was a a moment in my life where i could i could either fix you know go for the uh the cause of the problem or yep. just try and fix the problem again and i had a money problem yep i i'm i made quite a lot of money so i'd make six figures each year in in many different professions so i've been a i've been a uh performer in a band i've been a um audio engineer and I've been a winemaker and then a builder and then wow. a marketer. And in each one of the, the things I've been able to generate over six figures uh, each year from, from doing them. So I've gotten pretty professional in each area. But say I make 10000 I'd spend 11000 That yeah. That was me. And then in Nicaragua, it was kind of the end of it. And it was like, you know what? I, I can't. Um, I need to like live life on life's terms. And I couldn't uh, get any help from anybody. So I started over from scratch in Nicaragua. Um, it was it was it was gnarly, but it was also it felt like it was the right thing to do for me. Uh, you know, I haven't seen my kids in two and a half years. That's the, that's the hardest part about it. And there's some you know there's some back backstory to that, but I won't get into that. It's it was more of look, I can get money. You know, my friends will send me money. One of my friends said he'd send a plane, you know, to come and get me. One of my business partners says so like, <laughs> I can get, I can get the problem fixed, but I'm like, dudes, it's not the money. Isn't the, you can't fix a drug problem with a drug and you yep. can't fix money with a money, money problem with money. So I said, I'm going to start up. I'm just doing it, man. I'm going to, I'm going to earn my way back, um, to, to Canada, the U S and, you know, be with my kids and stuff. So that was two and a half years ago, man. And I, uh, yeah, I, I had a great job. I, I wound up quitting my job and stuff. So I, I wound up uh, homeless, dude. I slept behind the church in San Juan del Sur. Wow. I, um, yeah, I didn't have a driver's license, an expired visa, 400 days over. Um, I didn't have credit cards or a bank or nothing. And, um, and I was just really trying to sort out, like really dig into like, how do I, you know, freaking solve the cause of the problem? 
And um, so then a lady um, asked me if I'd be her cuidador because she didn't have any doors on her house. So I was like, sure, now I can sleep on the floor in her house. And then I was, you know, after a couple of days, because it was kind of a traumatic time for me. Um, after a couple of days, I was like, dude, I can, I can fix her doors and kind of a carpenter. Uh, so then I built her doors and then, you know, I refinished her kitchen and then I, um, built bedrooms for her and helped her start an Airbnb a little bit. And a guy came by and was like, Hey, would you check out my, my build and, and see what, see what's going on? I think something's wrong with it. His name is George. And I was like, sure, man, I'll come, but I don't have any, I don't have any way to get there, dude. I, I, I don't have any, you know, I was getting paid, um, $15 a day, $14 a day to be the cuidador. So I had that to eat and everything. So it wasn't very much money. So um, this guy gave me a ride up to his place and I walked around his construction site. And uh, it was a story I'm sure you've heard a million times. He uh, $60,000 for a reno on his house. Uh, they wanted 30,000 up front. They would be done in six months. I was up there eight months after they started and he had wound up giving them all 60,000 already. And oh they my wanted God. more. Wow. Yeah. So I walk around and I'm, you know, I'm not the Tony Lewis that I used to be building wineries. I'm Tony Lewis sleeping on the freaking floor building doors in San Juan del Sur. So I walk around, I'm just trying to be as honest as I can. And I'm like, you know what, man, when I see like a pile of bricks over here and like some brick tools resting in this puddle, it's kind of like, I don't know if that's right. I, I don't, I wouldn't do that with my tool. And then we go over and we see a pile of drywall and some drywall stuff. And then we see, you know, and it, the story goes all the way around his house. And it was kind of like, dude, it's kind of like my kids are playing around, you know, and leaving their tools, yeah. their toys out. And he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I, I don't know what to do about it because I don't know anybody here or anything. I had done, I built a wine bar in, in Hacienda Iguana and I built a restaurant in Tola and I'd done some building before this in Nicaragua. Um, so then he said, you know what? I'll pay you to come up here and sit and watch everybody work. And I was like, for sure, bro. I'm in a hundred percent. And he wanted to give me $40 a day. So I went from $14 a day to $40. Uh, even there was a couple of days I was swinging machete and stuff. Like it was, it was pretty manual labor. So this sounded great. I did that. And, um, slowly, uh, but quickly, uh, I fired each person because it was like, dude, you yep. know, I'm supposed to watch you and you're not working. So you got to leave. And then he asked me to hire my own crew, you know, and I went and found like guys that I had worked with before and I built up a crew of like six people. And then, um, then I was up to 70 bucks a day, which was like, wow, dude, you know, I'm going to do it. This is going to work. And, um, then that project ended. And during the time I, I wanted to solve the biggest problem I could in Nicaragua. And at first I thought it was like immigration. So I learned all about investment immigration and stuff. And then I thought it was about buying cars and setting up SAOs. And then I thought it was about health insurance and then set all these ideas. But then I was sure I was like, dude, building is the biggest pain in the expat. That's why they go home, you know? So I said, look, I drew this thing on a napkin. And I was like, dude, I think I can build like a, a modular, like a Lego system out of readily available shit that we have here that anybody can do for me, you know, not relying on heavily sk skilled dudes. And he was like, this sounds awesome. Let's do it. So I said, I don't know how much it's going to cost, man. This is not like normal business for me. Um, but I'll sell you 5% for 15 grand. And he yeah. was like, let's do it. And I said, I don't have a bank account. I don't have a business and I have no way to take your money, bro. So give me a thousand bucks and I'll go find a lawyer to set up the account. I, I can't give the money back to you. Just being honest. If I fuck it up, it's over. Um, so he said, sure. I went to the lawyers and stuff and they were like, we need 3000. I was like, damn. <laughs> so I wound up finding two more dudes to start, start rad pie with me. Um, an electrician and, and a tiny house builder guy. It was amazing that I found these people. They kind of came to me. I was just I was so lucky or fortunate. And, um, then we got the money and we got the business started. And then eventually after the bank account opened, they put their money into it. And then, um, then just miracles, dude. Like Sinsa, the the big hardware chain in Nicaragua, they have they have twenty something stores. They're big, big deal, a hardware shop. They were like, Tony, dude, I love what you're doing. I love your story. Here's a warehouse, and they gave me this huge warehouse right wow. in the middle of of Rivas on the in between San Juan, right on the main road there. It was huge, dude. Like you could build houses in this thing. It was gigantic, and people drove right by it. So then we started building rad pads, and and we went, you know 
nine different versions and we built them. So we did like renders and then we, you know, we all decided, yeah, that's it. And then we tried to execute the render and we could, you know, so it was like we got to these nine, nine different versions. And uh, in the process, we developed a beach club down on uh, Playa Mahagual, one of the most beautiful beaches. Um, and uh, we built up nine partners. So I have nine guys and they're all like some of the smartest people in Nicaragua on the Rad Pad team. But they've all basically, uh, you know, uh, joined in. And every time it was like, all right, this is the next level of Rad Pad. Who's yep. going to help us get there? And um, so then that was going and um, that coastal road was coming in and uh, the government puts a hold on registration of titles when a road, a federal road is going through the property. So this, this property was 2,500 manzanas connected to the beach. One of our partners owns it and the road was going through it. So we had built rad pads and we, we were getting ready to sell and then we couldn't. And it was like, no. So, so that led us into, you know what? Maybe rad pad isn't the building system isn't what it's about. It's, it's about the biggest problem expats have here in Nicaragua or have up there in Nicaragua was generating income. So what they really needed was these people like um, the stories that I have, I have a channel called everything Nicaragua and there's just so many interviews of, of expats that sold everything. So they had like jobs, they were CEOs or they were somewhere up high in their business, you know, but they got a paycheck every month. They sold everything, cars, couches, house, and got one big nugget of cash and came to Nicaragua. They didn't really know how to manage that big amount of cash, you know? They they had every month would come in money yeah. and and that's how they lived. So they spent a lot of their nut right away, you know, and it started dwindling and they started getting scared. So they wind, wind up going home after about 2 years. So I thought, you know, if an expat could get here and buy a couple of rental units and start getting some cash flow from them, that's the biggest that's the biggest Pro, that's the cause of the problem is no cash flow for these guys yeah. so then then we thought we'd do rad pad as investments and we set them up on the beach and that's when i took the trip to costa rica and was like dude we got to do it in costa rica there are so many people in costa rica you know wow. and you just finished a project yeah. in costa rica yeah we did we just finished our first build in um uh platanillo it's right yeah. next to nyaka waterfall Nice. Yeah. I mean, how yeah. much does a how much does a rad pad cost here in Costa Rica? I mean, you've just done one, so I mean, yeah. I mean, how much? Right. So I know, I know, down to the penny right now. And and you know, we had some, uh, you know, outsourced things like the foundation and and a few other things, and and budgets changed dramatically from coast from Nicaragua to Costa Rica. So we do a a one bedroom a hotel unit. This includes like septic tank, electricity, water, hookups. Uh, interior finishings, the design, lighting, uh, bed sheets, toilet paper, like the work. We call it rent ready. And that goes for $35,000 USD. Wow. And it's, it, it's in 60 days or less. So, um, from start to finish, that's, that's everything. Like you don't do anything. You just point out that, that area. We really, if you get a chance to check out, um, uh, Paradise Lodge, it's the gnarliest spot you could ever imagine, dude. It's like a cliff. It's, wow. And it was jungle. We lot, didn't cut one tree. There's a lot tree. of that here. There is a lot. So it was, they wanted to take unusable or unused property and turn it into cash flow. Yep. So we were like, well, that's unused. And we were like, yes, yeah, yeah. it is. That's where we dump the uh, dead bushes or whatever. So, well, I think there's a yeah. lot of people that are looking to put some form of unit on their property. I mean, there have been quite a few kind of, I would say, kind of prefab style companies here. Um, right. They've kind of bumped along, but nobody's really owned that space, if that makes sense. Uh, I mean, we've worked with Ubale, Atlante Homes, Armasa, and they've kind of done a good job, but like nobody really owns that, that could kind of come in and, as you said there, in 60 days, get it done. Um, I mean, let me just switch gears. I mean, what shocked you most about Costa Rica, though? Uh, uh, you $16 like sandwich yeah, it's in expensive. Uvita. It's expensive. <laughs> no, that, but then, no, but what it did for me, man, I, I did it. I bought it. And I was like, what the? No. What? Re uh huh? You know, like it shocked me. I, I, I haven't had a $16 sandwich since Los Angeles. Um, and that was five years ago, six years ago. So what it did for me, though, it was exactly what I needed. I said, at this point, I can be a crusty expat guy that gripes about prices. Or I can say I need to be a more service to people so that I can afford to eat the sandwich. Because when I ate it, man, 
smoked turkey, Swiss cheese, fresh yeah. bread. It was fanta- it was fan- it was a hundred dollar sandwich that I got for sixteen uh, for sixteen bucks. Yeah. yeah. So so it changed my whole mindset right then and there. It was like, nope, I'm gonna I'm gonna figure out you know how to get people this cash flow rolling. Yeah, I mean a lot so of people. That was a good shot. A lot of people mention the cost here. You know, I mean, I say that people pay for the weather and the security here. Um, you know, that's what we're paying for. It's kind of a tax because our taxes really aren't that high, you know, comparatively corporate and personal tax. But, you know, I mean, just the cost of doing business here, if you have a business that you just understand from employees to social security to everything else that you need, I mean, the costs just rack up so quickly. Right. You know, something I learned in in uh, Nicaragua that that translated over here, but I think this would be very shocking for people that didn't have that Nicaragua experience, you know, if you're just coming in fresh and yep. building or doing a business is the amount of like surrender you have to do. You just have to, you know, or I, I'm sorry, I have to surrender when I'm like on the phone with the guy at the DGI store in San Jose. And I'm like, I would like this, 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 here's my credit card number. Please ship it to me. I'll pay whatever. My time is so much more valuable than my money. Please help me out, brother. And they're just like, no, we don't have that in stock. And I'm like, what? No. And then I go on DGI, blah, blah, blah. And it goes back and forth. I do, I don't, I do, I don't. And I had to drive there today and it's taken all day, right? I drove yeah. there. I go there. They got like 30 of them in stock yeah. of exactly what I wanted. Everything I wanted was right there. And then, you know, paying for it. It was like the debit card wouldn't allow that amount of money on it for some reason. You know, and I'm like on the bank. I'm like, dude, there's plenty of money. Yeah, but no. So, you know, I had to rely back to my lawyers and my accountants on the phone to, you know, up the something on it and then do a wire transfer. And then this guy had to get his boss to check it. And it was like that, that type of like just surrender, just, just be like, dude, you know what? You just can surf be the wave or you can be happy. Yeah. Surf the wave, it. man. That's it. Surf don't, it, dude. Don't yeah. fight it. Just go with it. All day, I'm going to be buying that camera is what I said this morning from yep. five o'clock this morning. Yeah. All day. Yeah. Yeah. yeah what, so. have you, what have you really enjoyed about Costa Rica though? Oh man. So many things, dude. I'll give it. So I wake up the other day. I mean, ah, oh, it's, <clears throat> you're making me so happy because I'm just thinking and my mind is jogging through all my favorite things about Costa Rica. Um, oh my God. Like swimming naked in a waterfall five minutes from my house man yeah <laughs> i know that sounds like really and like yeah you can't dude. do that in canada no no too cold too cold <laughs> <laughs> um but it's just like there, like that is like such connection to nature man like that the waterfall and that was after i swam in the ocean yeah. after i ran on the beach you know and got salty and just like you know yeah. salt is i think it's good for you and then ran up to a waterfall and jump in that sucker. Um, you know, that's just, it's so, but my walk home was just so like euphoric is what it was like. It was just, yeah. I felt so much vibration and charge that I can't get from anything. I know back, back in Canada, I would kind of get it from the gym. Yep. You know, I'd hit the gym hard. Uh, um, and that would kind of do it, but not, it's not the same. Like the monkeys, the toucans, and I'm not making it up. There were monkeys, there were toucans. Yeah. Um, the iguanas, the, uh, the, the cicadas, the, um, the birds, the people, you know, yeah. people making loud noises, you know, <laughs> people revving their motorbike. It's all part of it. And, uh, it's like a, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's just, it's amazing to me that that's yeah. my favorite part. Yeah. And then, then pickleball. Like I was playing pickleball last night. I don't know how to play pickleball. I just thought about it. And then it was like, there's people playing pickleball. Great. Let's do it. You know, yeah. and I don't have that spontaneity, I guess it is, or that it's just that it's just like everything changes all the time and it's okay. You're riding the wave. Yeah. Good for you, man. Good for you. Well, my last question for you is I've kept you long enough. If you had $500,000 to invest in Costa Rica, what would you invest it in and why? Oh, man. Um, Probably your answer is a bunch of rat pads, right? Yeah, yeah. I, you know what though if there was something better i'd do it and something better my mission is is um you know is pretty clear for me on an individual level of what i want and and uh that's you know if i'm going to own anything i'm down to like a backpack and a half full of stuff i'm a true minimalist uh, yep. well now i got a new drone um but um 
I would say if I had five hundred thousand dollars and I had to invest it in, or I was lucky enough to invest it in Costa Rica, I would um, invest. I would buy what I'm selling. I would I would set up a, a rad pad micro resort. I would brand it after a niche market that I could leverage to ensure its um, the occupancy. And uh, then I'd take that profit and do it again, I think. Because I, I really want to own assets that, that yep. earn cash flow now, not long-term investments. I don't yep. got time for that right Good now. You. Good answer, man. Yeah. Well, Tony, it's That's been an absolute thought. pleasure to have you here on the podcast. Again, very different totally, than any, any podcast we've had before, man. So it's, it's just awesome. Yeah. I appreciate you taking the time. Well, thank you so much, man. I'm just, yeah, thank you. And I'll keep watching your videos, dude. I love them. Sounds good, man. All right. Adios. Interesting podcast there with Tony, guys. As you can see, I mean, he's been up in Nicaragua, down here in Costa Rica, has had hard time, good times. But, you know, I think there is beauty in everything down here in Latin America, wherever you are. Um, I've, again, I've done some stuff in Nicaragua, but I, I, I'm, I'm staying very clear of Nicaragua. It just doesn't have the cash flow, of course, that Costa Rica does. Uh, and Panama for me is just, it was also just very difficult. Everything was a lot more difficult over there. Um, but I mean, you know, look, there's opportunity everywhere. I just have decided to focus here on Costa Rica, but I think the rad pad thing is very interesting. Um, you know, I think anyone that can build something that's built quickly and also efficiently, I think there's always going to be a market for that. You know, the one thing that people have and Costa Rica have is an excess of land. What people don't have sometimes is a hundred or $200,000 to build something. But I mean, if you can get something for thirty, forty thousand dollars that can also cash flow, um, you know, I think that that's a, a, a great opportunity for people out there. Um, you know, there is cheap land in certain areas here that can cash flow, uh, as a lot of you know. But, but anyway, guys, I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. If anyone wants to reach out to us and, uh, and see about working with us and our services, feel free to email us info at investing at That's info at investing You can also have a free 15 minute consultation with us and the team. Uh, the link is down below in the description. Um, and again, if you've enjoyed the podcast, guys, please pass the pod, uh, share it, uh, and also give us a great review. But until the next podcast, appreciate your time, guys. Bye. The number one Costa Rica real estate and investment podcast, bringing you experts from all over Costa Rica.